everybody and welcome to our first lecture uh, for the substantive material that we're going to be covering uh, in our post spring break um, part of this class. So this will be the lecture for assignment number 24, or actually the continuation of assignment number 24. We had begun that assignment before spring break. Uh, and we will be uh, talking a little bit more about the Commerce Clause during the uh, Rehnquist Court era. So you may recall that way, way, way back uh, before spring break, we had spent quite a bit of time talking about the Commerce Clause, about this power that the Constitution gives uh, to Congress in Article I, Section 8 to regulate interstate uh, commerce or regulate Congress, um, uh, commerce among the several states. And what we had seen is that the Supreme Court had had a lot of different views and a lot of different approaches uh, to what kind of power uh, exactly this was, uh, how broad of a power it was, and in particular, um, uh, how far into what had been previously more uh, the state's uh, areas of control uh, could uh, Congress uh, use this Commerce Clause power uh, to intrude upon. And uh, what we had seen, of course, was that in the era uh, leading up to 1937, in the pre-New Deal era, the court viewed this power very, very narrowly. Uh, there was a large uh, backlash to that, and we really saw the court switch almost on a dime in 1937 and enter into a period of really almost, it seemed, anything goes in terms of Congress using the Commerce Clause power to regulate all sorts of uh, activities uh, throughout the country. But then, right before spring break, um, we got to another important shift, and that occurred in the Lopez case. Um, so we saw the court going into the Lopez case, really having this ongoing debate. Um, on the one hand, we had justices who tell us that the Constitution gives Congress this power to regulate interstate commerce. Um, yes, at the time the Constitution was written, um, regulating interstate commerce was a, a, a more limited thing. But we have since grown into a much more robust national economy. Thus, at the same time, Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce has grown along uh, with this change. Um, that doesn't make Congress exercising this power in any way illegitimate or unconstitutional. Um, uh, and also, we don't need to worry so much about the states because the political process gives them ample uh, protection. Um, their pushback against the reliance on this idea of state sovereignty or the Tenth Amendment, this group of justices would say, was that the Constitution doesn't mention um, any kind of zone of activity that is supposed to be protected for the states, and the courts shouldn't be setting uh, its own limits that aren't found in the Constitution. Uh, doing so would be akin to what the court uh, was doing in before 1937, and really an invitation to judicial activism. On the other hand, we have a group of justices uh, who say that the Constitution established a system of federalism uh, in which the states retain uh, a great amount of power, and we have created a federal government of more limited powers. That the original understanding of uh, Congress's powers was supposed to be that it was not supposed to be that they could regulate everything and that there was nothing that was solely uh, left to the states. So this group of justices say the way we are interpreting this commerce power now um, gives Congress unlimited power and it gives far too little powers to the states and that it is the job of the Supreme Court uh, to step in and make sure that they are protecting this important separation of powers that was established in the Constitution. So before spring break, uh, we had um, gotten to uh, the point where we saw a shift in how the court uh, viewed this ongoing debate in the Lopez case. Uh, because Lopez was the first time in 60 years that the Supreme Court had held an act of Congress to be unconstitutional because it exceeded its powers on the Commerce Clause. Uh, as you may recall, uh, the court in Lopez told us that, there, that the power that Congress has under the Commerce Clause uh, is to regulate three different categories of interstate activity. 
Uh, they said that they can regulate the channels of interstate commerce. Uh, they said that they can regulate the instrumentalities of in interstate commerce. And then they also said that under the case law, they didn't say they were overruling any of the court's prior cases, um, that, the, that Congress has the power to regulate activities that have a substantial relation to interstate commerce. And so it's this third category uh, that the court is really thinking about in the Lopez case when trying to figure out whether Congress had the power to um, regulate the possession of firearms within a certain number of feet of a uh, school. And as I'm sure you remember, the court said that they did not, that this exceeded their powers, and they relied on three factors uh, to reach that conclusion. The three factors that the court looked to to decide that Congress did not have this power under the Commerce Clause um, was they looked to this economic versus non-economic uh, distinction in terms of the nature of the activity that is being regulated. And in this case, they said possessing a firearm uh, near a school is not an economic activity. It is a criminal law activity. Uh, and therefore, um, this is not a form of commerce. Commerce is about economic activity. The court also looked to see if there was a jurisdictional element, if there was something about the law uh, that limited what it was that Congress was regulating uh, very specifically and tied it very specifically to uh, interstate uh, commerce. Uh, and in this case, they found that there was no such jurisdictional um, element. And they also noted that there weren't congressional findings that would explain to the court how and why the court, the Congress had believed that uh, this activity um, had a substantial effect on interstate commerce. So we saw the court there reject a number of potential nexuses between um, uh, economic activity, uh, national violent crime, uh, um, and uh, this particular activity. They said whatever um, uh, ties there were, they were simply too attenuated, and if we would allow this, then we're simply going to be no limits to the powers that uh, Congress had to regulate. So after the court decided Lopez, the big question was, what just happened, right? Was this some kind of aberration? or were we entering into a new normal? And that question got answered for us in the year 2000 in the Morrison case. The Morrison case involved a college student, a young woman named Christy Brzonkala. Uh, she had just turned 18 when she was allegedly gang raped by two of her fellow college students who happened to both be members of uh, the football team at Virginia Tech where they uh, all went to school. So according to the facts that were um, stipulated uh, for this case, uh, uh, these two men, um, Antonio Morrison and James Crawford, they were at a party and they quote, pinned her down on the bed and took turns forcibly raping her. She then filed a complaint under the school's policy. There was a hearing. Uh, at the hearing, Morrison admitted that he did indeed have sex with her after she told him no, at least twice, um, and he's found to be guilty. Morrison appeals, that's the school's uh, ruling. There's a second hearing. He is found guilty again at that second hearing. So he's ultimately suspended for two semesters. But then uh, the administration of the school intervened. His charge was later reduced to, quote, using abusive language, and he was allowed to come back to school. Uh, Ms. Rosankala then also reported the rape to state authorities, um, but no charges were ever brought. Uh, she um, struggled after all of this happened. She ultimately overdosed on pills. She drops out of school. And then um, we get to this case when she sues under a, an act of Congress called the Violence Against Women's Act, which provides, among other things, a civil remedy provision for victims of gender-related violence. It allows them uh, to collect uh, attorney's fees, uh, which helps makes it far more likely um, for a woman to be able to get representation um, against what would um, otherwise be some kind of uh, you know, shallow pocket uh, defendant.
Now, there are actually two issues that were discussed in this case. Uh, the first is the one we're talking about now, whether or not Congress had power under the Commerce Clause to pass this provision in the Violence Against Women Act. But the second issue was whether or not they might have alternatively had the power to pass this provision under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, something we've talked a little bit about before, back when we talked about Heart of Atlanta uh, Motel. And we'll be getting to that issue and revisiting this case on that issue uh, again in a future class. So going back to our three factors in Lopez that seem to matter to the court in Lopez about whether or not Congress had this power under the Commerce Clause. Um, my first question to you all, uh, had I had you here uh, in class, uh, would be to put yourself in the shoes of the Solicitor General, the person whose job it is to defend uh, the federal government, and in this case, to defend Congress's powers to say Congress did have the power uh, to pass this provision in the Violence Against Women Act. How would you deal with Lopez? How would you look at what the court said in Lopez uh, to make your argument um, that even with Lopez on the books, Congress still had the power to pass this particular act? And so I'm going to uh, invite you at this moment to pause the recording uh, for a few moments to think about what you would say. Uh, are there differences uh, between this case and Lopez that are important, or is there a way uh, to say that Congress still did have the power to pass this provision, even under the framework that was established in Lopez? So I think that um, the biggest argument, and indeed the one the solicitor did uh, rely a great deal on uh, in distinguishing this case from Lopez, is the uh, third element that was important to Lopez, congressional findings. Because unlike with Lopez, this time Congress did include findings. And in fact, they included elaborate findings about the impact that gender motivated violence has on interstate commerce. Uh, it's an impact Congress concluded that was in the billions of dollars. Uh, they actually included a four year study uh, that Congress had uh, conducted regarding the impact on things like lost work time, uh, foregone business um, and uh, travel, uh, increases in medical costs, um, issues like the loss of uh, young women like Ms. Brzonkola who don't finish school and then have a, a diminished uh, ability to participate um, in the economy. Uh, here's just some of the data that Congress did um, uh, uh, include in their findings when they passed the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, they concluded, for example, that between five and $10 billion was spent on healthcare from um, uh, domestic violence. They found that 75% of women said that they won't attend a movie um, alone because of this fear of gender motivated violence. 50% don't ride public transportation alone when it's after dark. 50% of rape victims uh, have difficulty sustaining their uh, jobs. Um, but as we know, the majority uh, dismissed this data um, because they said, if we accept um, this kind of argument, this argument that uh, there is this link between this activity and um, uh, impact on interstate uh, commerce, then Congress will be able to regulate anything simply by aggregating together these types of economic effects to say that there is a substantial effect. So what we learn in Morrison is that of these three factors that seemed important to the court in Lopez, it's this first factor that now appears to be the most important of um, these three considerations. This question of whether or not the underlying activity is an economic or not economic activity, whether it has a commercial or non-commercial nature. And in this case, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist writing for the court uh, tells us that gender motivated violent crimes are not in any sense of the phrase economic activity. Uh, he says, like with possessing guns near a school, this is um, a criminal activity and we can't let Congress 
use potential economic impact of crime uh, in the aggregate as a way to allow them to regulate crime, uh, which is really a state concern. It's something that falls under uh, the state um, police powers. And so uh, the court tells us then, um, when we are in the world where we are dealing with a non-economic activity, uh, nothing else really matters. Um, we can't play uh, sort of the wicker game of adding all up all of those little impacts that you might get on um, interstate commerce from an activity uh, and end up with one big substantial impact on um, uh, the, the interstate commerce, that there's no aggregation of um, ec non-economic activity, as in Wickard, uh, when we are dealing uh, with something that uh, uh, is not economic. The court says that Congress cannot rely on a but-for causal change from some initial occurrence of violent crime to every attenuated effect on um, interstate commerce. You also might recall in the post-New Deal world that the court was being very deferential to Congress when it came to its conclusions about whether or not there had been a substantial effect on interstate commerce. They were applying just a rational basis test, asking uh, whether or not it was rational for Congress to reach the conclusion that this activity had a substantial effect uh, on interstate commerce, right? This is what they did in Wicker. Is this rational for them to conclude that all the farmers just growing more wheat to use on their farm would have an aggregate, the substantial effect? Suddenly we have a court uh, that seems much more skeptical um, of that. Uh, and a court that tells us that simply because Congress uh, reaches a conclusion that a particular activity has a substantial effect on interstate commerce does not necessarily uh, make it so. So the court suddenly seems like it's not going to be quite so deferential. Of course, we have the dissenters in this case saying that uh, what Justice Souter called this mountain of data that Congress has collected uh, should matter and does make this case very different from um, the Lopez decision. Justice Souter also asks, he asks the question, why is the majority tempted to reject the lesson painfully learned in 1937? which of course we all now know uh, is a reference to this pre-New Deal court uh, and its, its approach. Uh, Justice Souter is saying that we learned then uh, that these categorical approaches of trying to say uh, this is commerce and this is not commerce to say that this stage of business is commerce or this stage of business is not or manufacturing is or production is not, uh, trying to separate these things out don't work and that they invite judicial activism. I also want to point out that Justice Thomas writes a separate occurrence to once again, as he did in Lopez, make the argument that he thinks the court should reject this substantial effects test, this third category um, of activities uh, that Congress can regulate under the Commerce Clause. He says this is inconsistent with the original understanding of Congress's Commerce Clause powers, and it's not something that the court should be recognizing. And so I want to end um, the discussion of the Morrison case just by giving you um, a few questions um, maybe to think about, and then I hope that we can uh, chat a little bit more about when we meet um, on Monday for our discussion. So my first question is, uh, what do you think uh, about what the court is saying here in Morrison? Um, do you agree that there is something that is a different, an important difference, a difference in kind between gender motivated violence and the impact uh, it might have in the aggregate uh, on interstate commerce uh, versus something like um, homegrown wheat by the wheat farmers in the aggregate, their impacts on interstate commerce or on hotels uh, that have, or restaurants that have discriminatory uh, practices. I'm also really curious what you think about this question of the role of congressional findings in determining whether or not um, we are dealing with an activity that has a substantial impact on interstate commerce. 
Um, should the court be deferring to Congress on this question, as long as it seems rational and reasonable uh, to reach the conclusion uh, that uh, this does indeed have a substantial effect on interstate commerce? Or is this something that the court should not be quite so deferential on, um, ha have its own independent uh, judgment about and maybe uh, treat with a little more skepticism when um, Congress is reaching this conclusion? And then finally, I pose the question to you all about um, what about the states? And does it matter at all what they might want? Uh, because this whole question of limiting uh, Congress's powers uh, is always balanced as um, a protection of state rights and state powers. Because in this case, um, there were 37 states who that uh, filed amicus briefs um, in the Morrison case. Um, giving their opinions on what they thought about this particular provision in the Violence Against Women Act. And of those 37, 36 of them um, signed the brief uh, saying that they supported the Violence Against Women Act. They argued that their individual efforts as states to try to um, combat gender motivated violence were not being, or they were ineffective, um, and that the federal remedy was actually a complement uh, to their uh, state efforts. It didn't in any way undermine uh, what it was they were trying to do. Um, Georgia uh, actually was one of those 36 states um, that signed the brief in favor of the Violence Against Women Act. And uh, if you are curious, um, the one state that filed in, uh, against uh, the, the BAWA and in support of Morrison in this case was the state of Alabama. So think about those questions um, a little bit, and hopefully we can chat about them some more when we uh, have our live discussion. Okay, so after the court decided the Morrison case in 2000, it appeared at least that this economic versus non-economic factor was the most important of the three Lopez factors. Uh, so this was a situation as we led into 2005 when the court decided Gonzalez versus Raich. So this case um, arises out of the period of time when California happened to be one of nine states that was legalizing the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. And our respondents in this case are two California residents who suffer from a um, variety of um, serious medical conditions. And on their doctor's recommendations, they began using medicinal marijuana. Uh, so we have one of our um, uh, uh, petitioners here, or our plaintiffs here. Um, she grows uh, her own um, marijuana. She has six plants that she uses only uh, for herself. This is completely something that was legal in California at the time under state law, but it conflicted with the federal law, with the Federal Controlled Substances Act, which designated marijuana among um, and still does, among other drugs, with, quote, cur no currently accepted medical use, and that had a, quote, lack of accepted um, safety. So the federal law criminalizes the manufacturer, distribution, and possession with intent to deliver, and also just mere possession of marijuana. Um, and Congress in this case uh, did have a number of express findings uh, regarding interstate commerce, uh, that this um, uh, increases interstate uh, traffic and enforcement issues in the interstate, even if illegal market for um, medical marijuana. So I'm going to show you now just a couple of minutes from a video about this case. It's actually a trailer for a longer video that was put together about this case. But I think it's really interesting because you get to hear from some of the actual um, parties who were involved in the case and the actual lawyers in the case about how they viewed uh, what was happening um, and what they think the important legal issues are. That's my reality. If I don't have this, I die. The voters are smart enough to recognize that just because a patient might need a simple herb that grows out of the ground, it doesn't mean that they are legalizing a dangerous drug for all people. So I went out to the front 
went out to be on the carport there and sort of put my hands up and said, this is no problem, guys. You're welcome here. This is a, you know, simple little six plant medical cannabis thing happening. And as they get ready to leave, the DEA investigators tell the folk, oh, well, we're not leaving. No, that's still a federal crime. I said, you will not let them take those plants. You will pull your gun if necessary. It's impermissible to have it under federal law. You know, if you start turning away from that, well, where do you stop? If you, for example, you see a little bit of methamphetamine, you say, oh, well, it's not that much. We'll let somebody have a little bit after we leave. No, it's contraband. We take it. There they were, sweating away and cutting down the plants with a hand axe. It made me mad. It made me really mad. When I read about her raid, I was, I told my attorneys, I was like, that's the girl. We, we want to get her. There is no interstate activity whatsoever, and there's no commerce whatsoever. All of the cannabis that was provided to Angel and the cannabis that Diane Monson grew herself, all originated in California. This case illustrates why federalism is an individual liberty protection. It's not up to the Justice Department to decide whether there's efficacy in marijuana. It is the will of the Congress to repress drug abuse and drug use. Now, people were really interested in this case because what we saw going on, going into the Gonzalez versus Raich case, was a mix of the um, constitutional question, right? The how broad or narrow should um, the Commerce Clause be uh, with a flipping of what it seemed to be was the ideological question in terms of uh, should we have more or less uh, regulation of marijuana versus the cases we had perhaps in say like Lopez when uh, there was a different ideological take on uh, gun regulation. So um, there's a lot of interest in how closely it seemed like uh, justices would stick to their guns on what was perceived to be perhaps their ideological views about the issues uh, at hand. And I've always felt like uh, my friend Dahlia Lithwick at Slate uh, summed up sort of everybody's mood going into this case um, uh, in a way that only she can. Uh, when she wrote uh, about the oral argument in uh, the Raich case, she says, just as Antonin Scalia is in something of a tight spot today, on the one hand, he voted with the state's rights majorities in Lopez and Morrison. On the other hand, he isn't going to go off tripping lightly to the land of Cheech and Chong with those loonies on the Ninth Circuit who ruled in the rule of the federal drug, drug, drug law unconstitutional as applied to Raich and Monson. Justice John Paul Stevens is in a mirror image of that same tight spot. He frickin' hates Lopez and Morrison, but his sweet old heart bleeds for the folks who would die if their pot was taken away. And so we go into the case with this question, does locally grown marijuana for medical uses pursuant to state law, have a substantial effect on interstate commerce so that Congress can regulate it. And so I'm going to ask you all once again to put yourself in the shoes of the Solicitor General. Your job is to argue on behalf of the federal government to defend Congress's powers to be able to regulate, in this case, uh, the uh, medical use of uh, mar marijuana. And so uh, based on the Lopez and Morrison cases, my question for you is which of the justices from those cases would you think you'd have the best job of persuading on this um, Commerce Clause issue? Now, if your thinking is, I should be able to have the best chance of persuading the Lopez and Morrison dissenters the ones who wrote in favor of a broader view of Congress's ability to regulate um, over uh, states' uh, contrary um, regulations, then you would be right. Uh, in the racial majority, uh, we did indeed have uh, the Lopez and Morrison um, justices. We had Justice Stevens, uh, Justice Souter, Justice Ginsburg, uh, and Justice Breyer. Uh, but uh, we also ended up having uh, two more justices um, from the uh, Lopez and Morrison majorities that joined the majority in Raich. 
uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy. So I'm going to want to think a little bit about uh, why it was that we were able or that the uh, court was able in uh, the Raich case to be able to win their votes as well. But first, let's talk a little bit about what the majority said in the Raich case. So in the opinion, which was written by Justice Stevens, um, the court concluded that um, a regulation, Congress trying to regulate this activity, uh, was just like Wickard, right? That we were dealing with a home growing, the, the home growing of a commodity for which there is an interstate market uh, that Congress is interested in, just like with wheat, controlling the supply and the demand of this particular commodity in the interstate uh, market. And even if, just as with Wicker, this is um, purely local uh, and it was grown to be used just personally and not to be sold, uh, it is still commercial in the sense uh, that there is this interstate market and, it can, and this uh, practice of growing it um, for personal purposes uh, can be aggregated to have a substantial effect on the national uh, market. Uh, when you add in uh, the powers that Congress has under the Necessary and Proper Clause, the court said this falls under Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. The majority also didn't seem to find any problem distinguishing this case or fitting this case um, with the cases of Lopez and Morrison, um, accepting that Lopez and Morrison dealt with uh, uh, non-economic activity, the court in Raich says uh, that growing marijuana for medical purposes is economic activity, and therefore even under Morrison and Raich, um, this was within Congress's powers. Also noteworthy about the majority's uh, reasoning is the test that they apply to determine whether or not this activity taken in the aggregate actually had a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And what the majority does in race is apply the rational basis test. Um, they ask whether or not Congress had a rational basis for concluding that a failure on their part to be able to regulate the intrastate manufacturing and possession of marijuana um, would have a substantial effect on interstate commerce and their ability uh, to regulate the interstate market uh, for marijuana. They concluded that this was indeed rational. They noted that Congress also had uh, sufficient findings uh, to support this. And so the court in the majority was satisfied. I'm going to come back to Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy in just a moment. Um, but they wanted to first talk about those who were dissenting in the race uh, case. And so here we had three members of the majorities of the Lopez and Morrison decisions, Chief Justice Rehnquist, Justice O'Connor, and Justice Thomas. And Justice O'Connor, writing the primary dissent here, um, doesn't say that this belongs in the category of uh, economic activity that is just like Wickard. Uh, rather, they say, this case uh, is just like Lopez and Morrison. Um, that uh, growing uh, marijuana, um, uh, uh, legalizing or criminalizing marijuana, uh, this is not an economic activity. Um, this is a criminal question. This is a criminal activity. Uh, that we have a distinct class of activities, which is an intrastate, non-commercial, cultivation and possession of medical marijuana. So the court says there is no substantial effect um, on interstate commerce if we look at the class as it's um, uh, defined there. Justice O'Connor also makes the point that this is a good example of federalism as wor at work where we want the states to act as laboratories. Uh, she tells us that states should be able to experiment uh, with things like this. She makes a point to note that she personally wouldn't have supported it, uh, but that this is the kind of experimentation from the states uh, that 
um, ex-federalism work so well that a state like California can decide to legalize um, marijuana for medical purposes. Other states can uh, watch how that experiment goes and decide uh, if they also want to um, enact a law um, like that. So when we meet for our live um, discussion on Monday, I'm really interested to hear what you think about the, what the justices did here. Um, what is the right analogy? Is growing marijuana for personal use for medical uh, purposes, is this like wicker that we add it all up? It's an economic activity, there's a national market, we add it all up uh, and we get um, uh, a, a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Or is this more like Lopez or Morrison? This is a criminal matter. Possessing marijuana is a, is, is a criminal issue and it's the type of issue that should be left uh, to the states. Um, when we meet again, um, I, I uh, hope we can talk about that some. So I think we have a pretty good idea um, where seven of the nine justices were coming from with their votes in this case. But there are these other two, uh, which might be a little bit less obvious to us. Uh, so let's start with Justice uh, Scalia. He concurs in the judgment in this case, but he doesn't actually join Justice uh, Stevens's opinion. Uh, and he writes uh, to express what is just a slightly different view from the majority. Uh, and Justice, what Justice Scalia does is rely a great deal on the necessary and proper clause. Uh, he tells us that Congress has the power under the necessary and proper clause to regulate even non-economic interstate activities uh, only where the failure to do so could undercut its regulation of interstate commerce. In other words, he tells us that when it's necessary, under the necessary and proper clause, when it's necessary for Congress to regulate, to make regulation of interstate commerce effective, then they can regulate intrastate non-economic activities uh, that by the, that things that by themselves do not substantially affect interstate commerce. So he acknowledges Congress's power to regulate the interstate market of marijuana, and he says it is necessary and proper um, for them to regulate this intrastate activity of growing marijuana for medical purposes um, uh, in order to be able to effectively uh, uh, regulate the interstate market of marijuana. And then there's Justice Kennedy. And we don't really know what he was thinking because he didn't write separately. He just joined the majority opinion here. There's been some theories um, about uh, why um, he uh, voted this way in the Raich case. Some people say he still believes in drawing an economic, non-economic line. He just thinks this falls on uh, the economic side, that it is uh, more like Wickard. Um, there's others who say that he was simply just not willing to restrict Congress any further than Lopez and Morrison, that he had reached uh, his uh, limit. Uh, there's also the theory, which I'll have to admit I'm a bit partial to, uh, that uh, he simply just really hates drugs. Um, any case that involves the regulation of drugs, he is usually pro being able to regulate and crack down uh, on drugs. But uh, we don't know. Uh, we just know that he did indeed join the majority opinion in this case. So you might find yourself curious about how this case affects today's market for um, uh, both intra and interstate uh, markets for marijuana. And this in does indeed remain the law. Uh, Congress uh, still uh, has the possession and distribution of marijuana um, as listed as a crime under the Controlled uh, Substantive Act. Uh, the race decision still stands that Congress does indeed have this power to regulate uh, even intrastate um, uh, marijuana um, use or possession under the Commerce Clause. But what we have seen are very differing approaches from the uh, various administrations, the presidential administrations, about their approach to this. So under the Obama administration, they adopted an official policy of non-interference with state marijuana laws uh, in a series of Department of Justice memos, they declared that they were just not going to be in the business 
of um, interfering with whatever it is that states determine should be legal or illegal in their state when it comes to uh, marijuana. Um, so we then, of course, did lead to where we are now, where we have an increasing number of states that uh, um, legalized either medical use of marijuana or uh, recreational use of marijuana as well. Uh, but then once we entered into the Trump administration, there was again a shift. Um, back when Jeff Sessions was Attorney General, um, he rescinded those Department of Je uh, Justice memos and declared uh, that the federal government was going to start uh, being more forceful in its um, uh, enforcement of the Controlled Substance Act. There's been sort of some general uncertainty uh, from that point about exactly what that means or if there's going to be significant uh, shifts in approach from the federal government. Okay, that's all I have for you today. Uh, I look forward to virtually seeing and talking with you all in our class on Monday.